honored here today to have the presenter, Henning Stenfeld. Henning is the Chief Livestock Information Sector Analysis and Policy Branch of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. He leads FAO's work on livestock sector policies and their social, economic, environmental, and, and health dimensions. Henning trained as an agricultural economist at the Technical University of Berlin. In his early career, he worked in Ghana, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, and Rwanda in development projects, research, and capacity building. He joined FAO in 1990, first as a statistician, and since 1992 in the animal production and health division. There, he developed major work programs in the areas of livestock and natural resources and climate change, and poverty reduction through country sector policies. He leads FAO's support to the global agenda for sustainable livestock. It is my pleasure to welcome Henning Stenfeld to make his next presentation. Thank you very much for introducing me, and good morning, distinguished guests, and colleagues, and friends. Um, it's my honor to talk about livestock and, and the environment, and it sort of follows nicely on the previous talk, uh, but also the introductory addresses that we had uh, this morning. I will go through drivers, impacts, and responses, and in so doing, um, try to provide both a global overview, but also differentiate the message that I think this subject is suffering from the fact that we are very often we are making blackhead statements. I need to move it like this because otherwise I can't see the screen. First, I would like to talk about the global drivers influencing livestock production, and uh, as we have already heard this morning, uh, it's all about the rising demand for animal products. We've had, um, back in 1999, a report called the Livestock Revolution, which indeed was, at the time, produced by Hilary, IFPRI, and FAO. They coined the term of the Livestock Revolution it referred to the rapidly rising demand in Asia at the time, mostly Latin America also, and this livestock revolution has now arrived in Africa. So what we have is a um, demand increase of 70%, as we have already heard from the minister before, but particularly in Africa, an almost three times expansion of demand for meat, but also for milk. So it is against this um, strong drive of um, demand that we have to um, pitch our efforts. Uh, it is getting, of course, complicated by the fact that climate change will affect production in many, many different ways. Uh, we are not having only higher temperatures and shifting rainfalls, but uh, particularly and importantly, we're having a variability that will complicate the lives of um, smallholders and partialists in particular. Further complicated by growing resource scarcity as reflected in prices for land, prices for energy, and also prices for nutrients. There's only limited land that can be used for agriculture, agriculture expansion. And already one third of arable land is indeed globally used for feed crops. In developed countries, uh, this figure is more close to 50 or 60 percent. 50, 60 percent of the land is used for producing feed, arable land. Land degradation is rampant in many parts of the world. Water scarcity is affecting already about one third of the global population. Energy prices are rising, even though yesterday we saw a, a three or four year low in terms of oil prices, but the long term trend is certainly upwards. And nutrients also, and particular phosphorus, is becoming scarcer. Now, um, in this picture, one thing I personally find very 
interesting is that there are a total amount of 6.4 billion tons of feed used for animals. 6.4 billion tons, that translates into something like 850 kilograms per person living on this planet. So there's a huge amount of biomass that is, is attributed uh, to the life cycle. A large part of that, however, is not edible. More than 80% of all feed that goes to livestock is not edible. So we're having the cereals at about 9%. We're having other edible material, like again 9%, including cassava um, and, and beans and soybeans. Uh, but the rest is really not edible. And countries like Ethiopia or India or Kenya or, or any other country in, in Africa or South Asia really don't use much grain. They are basically producing um, with resources that have no alternative uses very often, and they make a huge net contribution to animal nutrition. Without that, uh, many people would not be able to, to sustain their lives and have uh, animal products in their diets. So what about the, the impacts? And I think the point here is that generalizations really don't help. So I just want to go quickly through uh, four different situations. Here we have uh, Senegal, where there is a growing constraint with regard to access to resources, in particular grazing and water. And of course, if you look at the system, greenhouse gas emissions, if you want to calculate them, they're very high. They, they are one of the highest, actually, that you can find around the world because these animals are not very productive. They, 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 they live long and, and produce very little. But they produce many other things which we don't capture in a, in a traditional life cycle analysis. We heard this before. They are saving, they are insurance, they provide many other goods and services that are not easily captured by economic analysis. Another system is intensive pig production in Thailand. Uh, again, this, uh, in, in contrast to the previous one, here we're having a system that is actually depending on imported feed quite a bit, in particular protein. It's, it's a system that, that has low emissions if we calculate them. But there are other environmental impacts, such as pollution uh, of water, uh, and then there are impacts associated with the production of that feed, which may be in Brazil or some other place. And there are also impacts on biodiversity, which are not easily captured. Another system is um, dairy production in, in OECD countries. Uh, these systems use a lot of roughage, silage, uh, maybe 30% of concentrates. They're very productive. 20% the number of animals is only 20% of the global herd, but they produce more than 70% of the global milk production. So it is a very efficient system in terms of producing milk. And here, the main sources of emissions would be from enteric fermentation, but there's also lots of fossil fuel use in the systems, which also add to climate change. Another system is um, beef production in Brazil which is really uh, very extensive in most places. Grass-fed systems are dominant. A small but growing share of animals are put through feedlots. Uh, here, uh, it is, again, the animal itself, the enteric fermentation that produces greenhouse gas emissions. But there's also a large impact on, on environmental services, particularly biodiversity, because in many places, uh, expansion of, of pastures is at the expense of forest, and that um, has large impacts on, carbon, on the carbon balance of these areas and biodiversity. So uh, now to the more aggregate picture. Now, a little bit the message over the last four or five years has settled on a figure of 20 or 30 percent agriculture's contribution to climate change. And that is really considering the whole chain of production, looking at land use, looking at fertilizer production and use, looking at feed production, uh, livestock itself, but also then the transport and moving and retailing and so on. So if you put all this together, you come to a figure of between 20 and 30 percent that agriculture makes up of total anthropogenic emissions of climate gases. And if, again, looking around the different refer references, but there is a consensus now that a majority, about two-thirds of all agriculture emissions come from livestock. 
and there is an overriding role of ruminants in that picture, um, cattle making up about two-thirds of all emissions. Most important sources, enteric methane, that is really tied to the biology of the animal, something that cannot be easily changed um, except through uh, productivity increases, which is a major way of reducing enteric methane, at least in terms of emission intensity. I'm coming to that in a moment. Feed production, and again, that is connected to land use and fertilizer use and emissions from nitrous oxides and uh, CO2 as well, is the second largest source. Animal waste uh, is, is the third one, and then land use uh, would be uh, also an important source. But there is a strong relationship between productivity and emission intensity. And that is saying that in particular in ruminants, uh, the higher your productivity, the lower the emissions per kilogram of output, be it milk, be it, be it meat. And what we found in our analysis is that uh, there is quite a potential to reduce emission intensity by looking at the um, variation in emission intensity here. I hope you can see it um, looking at different species. And what you can see is that there is a wide range of within which emission intensity occurs in these systems. So uh, quite, a, quite a wide spectrum of different performances, very often in very similar environments, but using different forms of management, you come up with very different outcomes. So there is a large variability of emission intensities within systems and regions, but we also found that with existing practices, with existing application, of application of existing technologies, there's quite a large scope to mitigate without introducing actually any new technology. So we found this to be, on average, to be 30% globally. But if you think about systems change and technology change, that potential would even be much larger. And this is, uh, if you calculate emission intensity on the basis of kilogram of protein, here across all species, across all products, it tells you where we have to focus our attention. It, it tells you that the emission intensity in Africa, in South America, in South Asia are much higher than in other parts of the world. And it is here where you get the highest returns, not only in terms of productivity increases, but also in terms of reduction of greenhouse gases. So, uh, the impact of climate change on livestock is something that very often is not discussed in this context, but here we have, of course, uh, livestock systems are very much exposed to the impact of climate change through lower rainfall and higher temperatures, through changing disease patterns, and as I stressed before, because of the variability, making management really a headache for many producers across the world, particularly in drylands. Um, but also, and I think that is an important point that very often is not stressed, that livestock are very flexible resource users. They, they can move from one feed to another very quickly, and they adapt to changing market conditions also quite quickly. It is the buffer in many of in food systems, if you want, because they can resort to very, very many different feed resources. It can change intensity. It can change location. So we're looking at, in a way, at, at, as a natural adapter to climate change, which is something that I think strategically we need to emphasize much more, that with the livestock sector, we're having a natural adapter to climate change. It's not something that we have to look at so, uh, the livestock sector necessarily as being passive and just being a recipient of climate change. It can have play a very active role in adaptation. Um, coming to nutrients and nutrient efficiency, this is just this, not going into the details here, but it explains the various steps of the production process and the fact that out of 100 kilograms of nitrogen put into a beef production system in developed countries, we are only harvesting about 11% on our plate. All the rest, 89%, 90%, is lost. So we're having a food production system that loses 90% of the original nitrogen input. Uh, that said, uh, 
there's also an important role of livestock in nutrient cycling, which you see actually uh, in, in the first part of this graph where there's an increase, this 100 become 134 because there is the uh, flowback from, from the waste that increases the initial nitrogen, but then it, it dwindles as we, as we go on. But, uh, of course, there is an important role of livestock in nutrient cycling. Looking at water, uh, there's various studies on this, but uh, livestock make up about 30% of total agricultural water use. Uh, livestock have an impact on vegetation and through that also on water cycles, uh, very often implying higher runoffs, particularly in hilly and mountainous regions. And there is the issue of water pollution in intensive systems, which uh, have uh, very often very high local impacts in areas where a lot, of er a lot of livestock are concentrated on limited space. So the opportunities for recycling that waste is limited and it leads to nutrient loading. Looking at uh, biodiversity as another dimension of the environment, uh, and it really here, um, land use is, is, is a major factor here because the extent of pastures is so vast. 26% of all land is, is, is uh, in pastures. They're both positive and negative impacts, um, but um, very often, uh, sometimes it can be managed in a way that it, it through mosaic landscapes, through uh, reducing or bush encroachment, that this impact is positive, but also very often it is negative. There's also an impact on biodiversity through feed production in the context of using arable land for feed, and that land is not available for biodiversity. Uh, the impact on aquatic systems through nutrient loading and, and uh, the positive roles that I have mentioned before. Now, uh, looking at biodiversity, there's two concepts that have been discussed, and it is really about land sharing uh, as opposed to land sparing. Two different approaches where in one land sparing option, you can intensify your highest potential areas, leaving um, some land aside for unfarmed, uh, where you have a high species diversity and density, so you can keep uh, parks or areas untouched if you use um, other areas very intensively. And the other approach is land sharing, where you move to intensities that are uh, moderate, uh, where you have um, both medium production and moderate levels of biodiversity. These are really two different ways of, of looking at it, and um, this can be perhaps expressed through this graph here, where we see that uh, uh, at moderate levels of intensity, the land sharing approach may be best, as opposed to when you have very high or low intensity where land sparing is the best approach. So uh, looking at what are the different options to respond to all these environmental challenges, uh, I think the key question or one of the key issues is the focus on efficiency. The efficiency of scarcer resources, particularly focusing on land, water, and nutrients, and as they are engaged in livestock production and trying to squeeze as much as possible out of these uh, resources, which very often are becoming uh, very scarce. In that context, the efficiency of resource use correlates very well with emission intensity. So if you use your, efficiency, your, your resources efficiently, it also means that you're, having, you're lowering your emission intensity. And that is that the CO2 equivalent footprint of your products measured in per unit of product is going down. So the sustainable intensification approach by specifically looking at feeds, genetics, and health, as we have heard in the previous presentation, it is, is a primary way of achieving that. You also need to look at waste and trying to reduce waste through recycling and recovering nutrients and, and energy. And we've heard about biogas earlier this morning. All this will probably not happen fast enough by itself. So it requires incentives, regulations, and, and innovation continuously. The, another response would be to look at enhancing livelihoods and human well-being because you cannot solve this environmental equation without 
looking at the multiple functions of, of livestock, particularly in smallhold and partial systems. And here the, the need to protect assets to keep animals productive serves environmental functions as well. You need to look at integrated landscape management, and as I said before, with this uh, land sparing and land sharing uh, alternatives, but trying to optimize contributions rather than maximizing output per hectare of land by also looking at biodiversity, water, and cultural values is something that we need to follow, particularly in areas which are fragile, which are marginal, which, which are not easily intensified. In that context, uh, particularly talking about uh, developed countries, but also increasingly emerging countries, overconsumption, healthy diets, and the role of, of, of animal products in excess consumption, you may want to call it, is a way of reducing impact, and I think that's also being recognized in, uh, increasingly. Uh, food feed competition I've referred to before, and also uh, before our Ethiopian guest speaker spoke about it, that's something that we need to closely look at, trying to push towards um, livestock and feeding systems uh, where the competition directly uh, through land use, but also indirectly through prices, is minimized. Protecting resources uh, is, um, particularly val valuable resources, is, is another response. So limiting livestock expansion into valuable ecosystems and if the um, estimates for greenhouse gas emissions from the livestock sector are, have come down, it is also because um, deforestation is actually slowing down. And Brazil has made uh, significant efforts in this, in this regard. It actually halved its deforestation rates in the last eight years. Protecting water resources and, again, the need to uh, install incent incentives and regulations. Resilience, uh, and I've referred to livestock as a tool of adaptation and improving the caping capacity to deal with uh, climatic shocks, but also other shocks, and uh, the need to improve governance of uh, global commons and the climate change discussion and what is happening with um, COP21 in Paris next year, but particularly also in local contexts, looking at ways by which uh, the, the um, use of communal grazing and water resources can be made more efficient and more equitable is an important way of addressing environmental issues. Environmental services and payment for these, combat markets, these are tools by which this can be achieved. So in, in summary, uh, we're having a large environmental impact of livestock. We're having negative and positive impacts. We need to consider these in the context of growing demand climate change and growing scarcities. We need to recognize the diversity of systems, issues and responses and keep in mind that very, very different. You know, the, uh, any blanket statement about livestock is probably wrong. Um, we need to realize that there is a large respond, uh, potential to respond and particularly through the productivity and emission intensity equation there are social and economic co-benefits that can be also motivators to drive more um, funding and more attention to the livestock sector. <coughs> All this requires proactive policies, incentives, and innovation. Thank you. presentation. You've uh, nicely summarized your key points where you started looking at the global challenges, livestock contribution to climate change, impact of climate change to livestock, and noted that livestock are natural adapters. You also took us through a number of responses, and thank you very much for that. You I was worried because this morning you told me that you had 147 slides. So I was wondering if we will have time for our presentation. So thank you for cutting it by half. So that gives us time for questions. So I will open up to the floor. There it is, livestock and the environment, the need to balance how we present this topic. So it's your time 
to engage uh, Henning on this. I see Carlos. present a, a very comprehensive picture, which leaves one humbled at the complexity of this problem we have to tackle, which goes way beyond the agricultural sector into the environment, into nutrition. What is sort of the implication in terms of how to manage these types of problems? What type of research? How, how does one deal with this extremely complex system with so many different trade-offs? Seems like a huge challenge for any administration to tackle. Do you have any advice for the DGR in terms of research, investments to manage this complexity? It is mind-boggling for me too. So, um, <laughs> yes, it is very complex, and uh, I, I don't have a, uh, an easy answer to this. What, what I feel, however, is um, whatever doesn't have a price will not be managed well, and that's true for carbon, that's true for water, that's true for communal grazing. So, I think ways have to be find, found by which to devise incentive systems. And it's really the key is really on incentives, because without, without that attractiveness of certain options, of certain technologies, things will not happen as quickly as we want. So um, payment for environmental services, but also thinking about um, grazing fees, thinking about managing water better. But then the bigger debate about, about carbon. And, and, and here, I would hope that the climate change community sees the opportunities that they are for mitigation. And not that I think that developing countries will have to mitigate through the livestock sectors, but I think that funding can be mobilized because it, the productivity and emission intensity equations, they're nicely tally. And, and that is something that I think we, we can exploit more forcefully. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Orkner uh, from ILRI and ATA. Uh, my question specifically or is on the kind of incentives uh, that can be considered for the majority of the livestock producers. Uh, in the context of ILRI, of course, the producers are the smallholders, and most of the changes that we can see happen come from the smallholders. So what kind of incentives do we see for the smallholders to share uh, the concerns that we have? with regard to the environment, thank you. Well, I think the, the sort of trying to, if you talk about climate, trying to provide incentive, direct incentives based on carbon credits, it proves to be very difficult because uh, they require very uh, complicated monitoring and certification work. They, particularly on, on soil carbon, it's, it's difficult to, to measure, it's difficult also to gorge whether these um, carbon sequestration is, 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 is actually lasting over time. So you will need to think about other ways of getting these incentives to farmers more quickly. Very often the adoption of new technologies is actually hindered by upfront investment costs that have to be met. And I think um, donors or whoever has an interest in developing the livestock sector will need to think about providing incentives in an indirect way, which can be via prices, it could be via uh, lowering input prices, it could be via uh, extension in training. So you look at, at I indirect ways of providing these incentives rather than tying it to uh, a, a carbon market or anything like this. Thank you for that presentation. Let me ask you, hopefully, a slightly simpler question. Uh, you draw our attention to this strong relationship between productivity and emission intensity, and then you went on to say that uh, you could achieve 30%, or it's possible to achieve 30% mitigation with existing technologies. But to what extent is that achievable while maintaining the productivity? And insofar as it isn't, you mentioned several times the climate change, the UNFCCC. To what extent do you think there's scope for those mitigation finance possibilities in livestock systems? 
And the reason I ask that is our chair, if she's still in the room, uh, Lindiwe, uh, one of her activities at climate change meetings was to go and give out badges saying no agriculture, no deal. And most of the country delegations were very polite, but they didn't exactly rally round. We made some progress in terms of climate smart agriculture, adaptation in other words, but not in terms of mitigation. So two linked questions. Thank you. Climate change mitigation in livestock is, is very difficult because there is no, even the discussions for COP21 do not include livestock. For most countries, there's only New Zealand that I'm aware of that actually has something like a, a um, emission target for, for the livestock sector. All other, no other country has that. Um, but I, what I've seen in the last couple of years, particularly through the movement on climate smart agriculture, that uh, large institutions, including the World Bank, now say that 80% of their agricultural lending programs would be on climate smart agriculture, so that, that their agricultural lending actually gets climate as an integral component of, of, their, of their programs. And I think it is through work like this that, that uh, there will be some dynamic injective in, into this discussion. So uh, um, the participation of the livestock sector in climate, in, in carbon markets is difficult because it all rests on models, it all rests on, on assumptions. Um, and what we've done particularly in, in, in China is we have developed a methodology for measuring soil carbon and actually established a methodology by which um, the voluntary carbon market can be targeted. So that, that is something that we've done and I hope that more research will help us to develop more robust and, and, and functional methods for, for this to happen at a larger scale. I see some hands. I think I'll take the last two. I can see a hand here. Okay, that's Yeah, thank chance. you. Um, <coughs> my name is Kaika uh, Sandingo Telele, Deputy Minister uh, from Tanzania, Livestock and Fisheries Development. Now, um, at least for a long time, at least in Tanzania, where I come from, livestock keepers and pastoralists have been accused of destroyers of the environment due to their movement from one place to another in search of water and pasture. Now, as an expert on the in this area of livestock and environment, what is your opinion on this accusation? Thank you. I'm not sure I have an answer to this, but uh, what, is, what is clear is that, that as I tried to say in my presentation, that there's both a positive and negative um, impacts of, of livestock moving on partial areas. Um, it has to do a lot with um, seasonality of movements, but also with density of animals. Um, and uh, I've recently visited uh, Namibia, which may have similar conditions in at least parts of Tanzania, where a bush encroachment at a large scale is happening because of um, overgrazing in many parts. And productivity of animals is very low. So one idea that they've been discussing is um, to have an incentive scheme by which you combine both the carrot and the stick in one instrument. So in other words, you pay a very modest grazing fee for animal, animal for every animal that there is. But that money is used to incentivize early offtake when there is a drought. So the farmer, the animal keeper, understands that you know it works both ways. Uh, yes, there is a cost of keeping my animal on that pasture. It's not for free. But that money can be used to help me um, destocking before I lose my animals. So combine, and having that managed at the communal level in order to really have a sort of decentralized, devolved type of decision making. And I kind of like the idea of combining the, the stick and the carrot in, in one policy instrument, in one incentive scheme. This may be something that 
discussed also in other places. 